everyone good evening or good morning if you're over on over the, the shore in London. Um, students, faculty members, and guests of Tufts University, welcome to the 35th annual Norris and Marjorie Bendetson Epic International Symposium on Preventing Genocide and Mass Atrocities. My name is Alex Smith and I'm a fourth year undergraduate student, member of the Institute for Global Leadership's 2920 Epic Colloquium. I am pleased to be your moderator for our panel titled After Genocide, Prosecution, Transitional Justice and Reconciliation. Um, just to give a little bit of announcement, the format of this will be, I will be introducing our three panelists, then we'll have a period of time that will involve just dialogue between the panelists. You can submit anonymous questions to me through the chat. And then at that point, after the fact, we will um, invite you all to join different breakout sessions with e any number, any one of these panelists where you can ask them questions and you can meet them face to face in the Zoom in the um, breakout sessions that you'll access through links that will be provided in the chat. Mass atrocities are deliberate large scale attacks against civilians. In international law, mass atrocities are defined as genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. Also under international law, states have a responsibility to protect, to have a responsibility to prosecute these crimes. Holding people and states accountable for mass atrocities is believed to be a strong and critical deterrent against future atrocities. Over the years, prosecuting and judging mass atrocities have taken a number of different forms, from the courts and trials established at Nuremberg to judge the perpetrators of the Holocaust to the International Criminal Court in The Hague. There's also the International Court of Justice, which just handed down a judgment on Myanmar's treatment of the Rohingya. Ad hoc tribunals, such as those that judge the perpetrators in the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, and hybrid courts, such as those used in Cambodia and Sierra Leone. Increasingly, human rights monitoring and documenting initiatives and commissions have included international criminal investigation mandates. These bodies are encouraged to cooperate with and complement international criminal mechanisms and processes wherever possible. One such mechanism created by the UN General Assembly in 2016 is tasked with collecting evidence of violations in the Syrian civil war to support criminal proceedings in national, regional, or international courts in accordance with international law. And in addition to the prosecution of mass atrocities, there is also the question of how to rebuild a community following a genocide. What does transitional justice look like for the perpetrators and what about the victims? How can a, how can a community be reconciled after so much anguish? Can it be ensured that such atrocities will never happen again? These are all very complex and important issues and we are delighted to have our distinguished panelists with us th this morning or evening to discuss it. The format, as I've mentioned before, will follow. You'll be hearing five minute opening remarks from each of our panelists. First, we will hear from Dr. Vivian Dittrich. Dr. Vivian Dittrich is Deputy Director of the International Nuremberg Principles Academy. She is also a visiting fellow at the Center for International Studies at the London School of Economics and Political Science and an honorary research associate at Royal Holloway University of London. Previously, she has been a visiting researcher at i -Courts Faculty of Law, University of Copenhagen. Drawing on extensive field research, her work comparatively investigates the international criminal tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and for Rwanda, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia, the International Criminal Court, and the International Military Tribunal in Nuremberg. She has written on the notion of legacy and the process of legacy building at the international criminal tribunals and hybrid courts. She has broad teaching experience at LSE, Royal Holloway, and Sciences Po, inter alia on the politics of international law, on global crime, on international institutions, and on US foreign policy. Dr. Dittrich, thank you. Oh, first make sure that you're unmuted. Good evening and good morning. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. It is such a great pleasure to participate in the 
Tufts Symposium 2020, and I'd like to thank the organizers for kindly inviting me and for putting together such a wonderful program on such an important topic. Preventing genocide and mass atrocities is a pressing topic today, as David Sheffer so powerfully and thoughtfully explained in his keynote speech yesterday. Prevention certainly requires political will. Once mass atrocities are committed, prosecutions of these crimes is one avenue of action, and certainly judicial action comes after the event. The links between justice and peace are very strong. Properly pursued accountability for atrocity crimes can serve not only as a deterrent, but also is one key to reconciliation processes and the consolidation of peace. Impunity actually may destroy the social fabric of societies and communities and perpetuate mistrust, hence undermining a lasting peace. Allow me to share some reflections today on the immensely important and complex topic of prosecutions, transitional justice and reconciliation. Transitional justice consists of a range of measures, judicial and non-judicial, and today I'd like to focus on the role of prosecutions, which is one out of the panoply of possible responses following genocide and mass atrocities. Let me take you back for a moment to an iconic prosecution of the 20th century that started in Nuremberg. And today I'm joining you virtually from courtroom 600, which is the backdrop of my video. I will focus on three brief points today. The Nuremberg trials as a reference point for prosecutions of international crimes today, the Nuremberg principles and wider accountability efforts, accountability efforts today. Some 75 years ago, world history was actually made in courtroom 600 of the Nuremberg Palace of Justice, and Nuremberg has since been considered as the birthplace of modern international criminal law. On November 21st in 1945, Robert H. Jackson, the American chief prosecutor, opened the trial of the major war criminals in Nuremberg with words that have a lasting resonance today quote, that four great nations flushed with victory and stung with injury, stay the hand of vengeance and voluntarily submit their captive enemies to the judgment of the law is one of the most significant tributes that power has ever paid to reason. Quote end. Now Jackson understood that the four victorious powers, France, the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom and the United States were at a historic crossroads. Instead of taking vengeance, they decided to try the top functionaries of the National Socialist regime before an international military tribunal and let the law take its course. In the trial of the major war criminals, 24 individuals were charged. The focus was on three particular crimes against international law. The first category was crimes against peace, what today is often referred to as crime of aggression. The second was war crimes, and the third category concerned crimes against humanity, a legal novelty at the time. What was markedly absent in the Nuremberg trials as they unfolded was genocide. Now, one of the most common misperceptions about the Nuremberg trials is that it precisely was about the genocide, the Holocaust. Philip Sands has powerfully shaped um, our understanding of the origins of the concepts of both genocide and crimes against humanity in his critically acclaimed and powerful book, East West Street. Following the Nuremberg trials, um, a resolution 95 of the General Assembly in 1946 reconfirmed the principles that came out of the international trials um, that was recognized already in the charter of the International Military Tribunal and the judgment of the Nuremberg Tribunal. Later in resolution 177 from 1947, the General Assembly actually tasks the newly founded International Law Commission with formulating what are today known as the Nuremberg Principles. Now the Nuremberg Principles is the fundament of the work of the International Nuremberg Principles Academy today and guides our work forward. What were the Nuremberg Principles or what are the Nuremberg Principles? The Nuremberg Principles articulate such matters as individual criminal responsibility. Even those in the highest office, it articulates the right to a fair trial 
but also it articulates principles that the lack of imposition of a penalty in domestic law or acting pursuant to superior orders does not relieve a person from responsibility. Now the principle of original, the principle of individual criminal responsibility originates from the trials in Nuremberg and Tokyo in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. It was prominently enshrined as the first principle of the Nuremberg Principles, and as can be read in the Nuremberg Judgment, crimes against international law are committed by individuals, not by abstract entities like states. This is important for transitional justice efforts, given that not states or entire groups are tried, but actually individuals are put on trial. The paradigm shift since Nuremberg has set new standards for accountability and criminal prosecutions at both the international and the national level. Nuremberg has become a reference point in more recent calls for prosecutions and action to hold accountable particular individuals. For example, there's an, entitled, um, an article entitled Nuremberg Now by Milko Klarin on the onset of the conflict in the former Yugoslavia in 1991, or more recently, Amal Clooney, who said, this is your Nuremberg moment when addressing the United Nations Security Council and representing Yazidi survivors of sexual violence in April 2019. How did everything evolve ever since Nuremberg? Well, the history is, of course, too complex to, to wish to summarize here, and I look forward to getting into some of the details further in the discussion. But allow me to just mention that after decades of political inertia, the significant legal principles emanating from Nuremberg were revived and incorporated then in the statutes of the new generation of international ad hoc tribunals and hybrid courts. Um, and found its way certainly into the statutes of the International Criminal Court. Other milestones, of course, of legal developments that we have seen in the 20th century include the Genocide Convention of 1948, the amended Geneva Conventions of 1949 and their additional protocols of 1977. And more recently, we see the activation of the International Criminal Court's jurisdiction over the crime of aggression on 17 July 19, 2018, as well as the current efforts to establish a convention on the prevention and punishment of crimes against humanity, which will actually fill a gap in the edifice of modern international criminal law. It has been observed that one of the most common and yet to this day contested strategies for coming to terms with the past and the legacies of genocide and mass atrocities at least in the 20th and 21st century has been adjudication. Domestic and international trials have increased in size, scope and sophistication today. However, we know that there is an interplay of law and politics and I just like to quote Antonio Cassesa, the first president of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, who about the tribunal said that, quote, it remains very much like a giant without arms and legs. It needs artificial limbs to walk and work. And these artificial limbs are state authorities. Now, indeed, cooperation of states is key factor for effective prosecutions and trials. There has been certainly an awareness that international criminal tribunals and hybrid courts should leave a lasting impact beyond prosecuting a select number of individuals. As United Nations Secretary General Kofi Annan foreshadowed in the 2004 report on the Secretary General on the rule of law and transitional justice in conflict and post-conflict societies, he said, quote, it is essential that from the moment any future international or hybrid tribunal is established, consideration be given as a priority to the ultimate exit strategy and intended legacy in the country concerned. Indeed, the legacies of the ad hoc tribunals and hybrid courts continue unfolding to this day, and legacy building is ongoing, as I have written on extensively elsewhere. Now, in countries emerging from violent conflict and repression around the world, prosecutors often face significant challenges and pressures when seeking to investigate and prosecute. Hence, the important commitment to prosecute without fear or favor is fundamental. 
In many jurisdictions around Europe, groups of dedicated prosecutors are taking the lead in investigating and prosecuting serious crimes today under the principle of universal jurisdiction. And one current example of that are the international crimes committed in Syria, which are prosecuted by the Federal Prosecutor General in Germany on the basis of the principle of universal jurisdiction and under the German Code of Crimes Against International Law. Finally, it bears mentioning the vital role and the resilience of victims and civil society who play a critical role. It is often their determination and cooperation with prosecutorial efforts that actually ensure that prosecutions can proceed sometimes decades after the crimes were committed. Equally important is, of course, the effective cooperation between international and national mechanisms, as well as with civil society. Allow me to close with um, quoting Ban Ki-moon, who in 2012 said, we live in an age of accountability. It is an age in which there is an ever-growing emphasis on the responsibility of states to end impunity and to prosecute those responsible for genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and other egregious crimes. Well, to conclude the cause for prosecution of international crimes and for the primacy of reason are louder than ever today. But international criminal justice continues to be shaped by the interplay of law and politics. There is no immediate prospect for an end to impunity for all international crimes committed. But the outstanding significance of the Nuremberg trials for modern international criminal law and modern accountability efforts is evident in the lasting relevance of legal proceedings addressing wrongs committed and in the effective force of a rules-based international order down to the present day. I very much look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dietrich. Now we will hear from Dr. Tawanda Hondura. Dr. Tawanda Hondura is advisor and head of the rule of law section in the governance and peace directorate of the Commonwealth Secretariat in London. He was formerly the executive director of the World Federalist Movement Institute for Global Policy, the organization that houses and coordinates the work of the Coalition for the International Criminal Court. Dr. Hondura has extensive experience of using research, campaigns, and advocacy, grant making, and strategic litigations to influence change especially in the context of fragile and conflict-afflicted states. He previously worked as an investments director in the private philanthropic sector and as head of strategic litigation at Amnesty International, among other senior roles. Dr. Hondora? Uh, thank you, Alex. Um, and thank you to uh, Tufts University for uh, inviting me to take part uh, in this symposium. Um, and many thanks again for that introduction. Um, as we all know, genocide is a crime under international law in much the same way as war crimes, crimes against humanity are crimes. And often these crimes, uh, as you've noted, uh, Alex, are called mass atrocity crimes. With respect to genocide, there have been many genocides in the world both before and after World War II. But with most situations of conflict, whether or not a killing, a forcible transfer, the prevention of births within a group or serious bodily harm, uh, bodily or mental harm to members of a group with intent to destroy it in whole in part, whether or not that constitutes genocide is highly contested. Of course, the most famous uh, trial or cases that we know of are the Nuremberg trials, uh, as Vivian has so eloquently described. And in recent memory, uh, following the conflicts uh, in Rwanda and in the former Yugoslavia, the tribunals that were established there found individuals to be guilty of genocide. And again, you know, Vivian you know, aptly described the situation uh, in Syria where there are allegations, or at least some uh, of the people in Syria say they are victims of genocide. Um, 
in Sudan, in the case of Darfur, we had uh, we have uh, the former president indicted uh, by the International Criminal Court uh, for genocide. Um, but of course, these are not the only genocides that have crossed, uh, you know, and, and acts that have uh, of atrocities that have crossed the threshold. Historically, and in recent memory, we have the killings uh, in Namibia of the Herero people and the forcible transfer. Most wars of independence from colonial rule involved acts that many of the survivors would classify as genocide. Syria, obviously, Myanmar, with the cases that we've seen, uh, with the killing and forcible transfer of the Rohingya people, those survivors say they are victims of genocide. I'm hoping that uh, today we're going to discuss some of the reasons why only some and not all acts of mass atrocities end up being labeled genocide and why there has not been prosecutions and redress for victims of those particular crimes. So the question here is why? There's also a related question of have we done enough? Are we doing enough to make sure that all survivors have access to justice? And there's the question of which institutions, both domestically as well as internationally, should be the ones that are used to ensure that no single survivor, no single victim is left without justice. Related to that is a question, again, which I hope we're going to be discussing today, which is about the International Criminal Court. So the only and first permanent court with jurisdiction to try those responsible for committing mass atrocities, including genocide. With the move away and fracturing of multilateralism and an increase in nationalism, the risk of war increases has increased. And at the same time, we see a concerted effort, not only to undermine, but in some respects, to destroy the International Criminal Court. Are we witnessing a world where victims of genocide are more likely to not get justice because of the onslaught and attacks against the court, the International Criminal Court and what it stands for. And if that happens, what hope do victims have and survivors of genocide have? And what hope do we have to ensure that the principles that we've worked so hard to establish since World War II remain to be the standard against which uh, the acts of individuals are judged and for with respect to which victims can use in order to be able to get justice. So clearly at play, they're geopolitical factors. And again, it'll be interesting to discuss which of those geopolitical factors are likely to undermine and or strengthen and create opportunities for perpetrators of genocide to be brought to justice and what we can do as students, as academics, those of us who work for in, in civil society or international governmental organizations um, in order to ensure that the phrase never again is not only a mantra, 
but a statement that brings reality and that brings justice to victims of acts of genocide and other mass atrocities. Thank you. I hand over back to you, Alex. Thank you, Tawanda. Uh, lastly, we will hear from Terry Seng. Terry Seng serves as the founding president of Civicus Center for Cambodian Civic Education, a local Cambodian NGO. Prior to that, she founded the Cambodian Center for Justice and Reconciliation, now a major component of Civicus. Terry was born in Phnom Penh in 1971, and under the Khmer Rouge, she lived in Sphirang province bordering Vietnam, where the killings were most intense and where she spent five months in a prison. The Khmer Rouge killed both of her parents, and she and her surviving family trekked across the border to Thailand in 1979 and emigrated to the U.S. one year later. Since 1995, Terry has been in Cambodia volunteering with various labor and human rights groups. In January 2004, she moved permanently to live and work in her country of birth, after earning a BS from Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service and a JD from the University of Michigan Law School. She has written about her life in a book entitled Daughter of the Killing Fields. Terry? Hello, everyone. Greetings from Cambodia. Um, thank you to Tufts, in particular, Dr. Abby Williams and um, Heather Berry and their team and the student organizers. My goodness, it's past midnight for you guys. Kudo, uh, you are such troopers. Um, and hello to my co-panelists, Vivian and um, Tawanda. Is that correct? Yes, Tawanda. I'm so glad to be in a conversation with you over Zoom. Um, the topic is after genocide, prosecution, transitional justice, um, and uh, reconciliation. After genocide, in the Cambodia context, the question becomes, which one? Um, everyone knows about the Khmer Rouge genocide, and I use the term genocide expansively um, in the vernacular. Um, the legal definition up until recently was questionable. The term auto-genocide came up in the Cambodia situation. Um, but the Khmer Rouge gen genocide um, is well known. But what is less well known or really not known at all in particular to the younger generation um, is that the Khmer Rouge genocide was sandwiched by multiple genocides. Immediately previous to the Khmer Rouge years, April 1975 to, Gen, uh, to December 1978, the years of the Khmer Rouge, immediately prior to that, we have the US bombings, carpet bombings. Um, that is arguably legal genocide. And then immediately after the Khmer Rouge genocide, without a split second difference, we have the decade long military occupation by Vietnam, third largest military in the world then, lording over the survivors, the immediate survivors of the Khmer Rouge. And during those dark years, um, which no one writes about really, because it's been overshadowed by the Khmer Rouge years, multiple genocides, legal genocides also occurred. It speaks to um, what um, Dr. Tawanda was um, alluding to, the selectivity of genocides. How do we choose which genocide to acknowledge and which one not to? And then it also um, alludes to the interplay of law and politics here, as mentioned by Dr. Vivian. Um, so I'll just focus on the Khmer Rouge genocide, because that is well known in and during this next few minutes um, of introduction. Um, I'll, re uh, I'll acquaint or reacquaint you with the Cambodian situation and bring it up to date. Um, we have prosecution, we have the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. Notice that it's not the US bombing tribunal, it's not the occupation tribunal, it's the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. That's inform informally we know that. The official name is the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia. So we have a legal mechanism prosecution, the court. So if this is pure domestic um, court system, and this is pure international court system, and there's a spectrum here, the Khmer Rouge Tribunal is right here. It's a hybrid court. It's not like um, the one in Rwanda, um, where it went through Security Council. Because, um, it, it, so it has UN 
players and actors and prosecutors and judges and officials with Cambodian judges and officials, but the Cambodians always are um, one more, um, what we call the supermajority. So it's closer, the, uh, the extraordinary chambers is closer to the pure domestic court, thus the name in the courts of Cambodia. And as the hybrid court is funded by the international community, it's based, located in Cambodia, in a military compound of all places, on the outskirts of Phnom Penh until they realize, oh, the agreement said that it has to be in Phnom Penh, so they re- draw the map of Phnom Penh to include the military compound to satisfy the language of the agreement after the facts. Anyway, so these are some of the limitations of um, prosecution I will address in the, uh, in the um, breakout session. Right now, right now in Cambodia, we have the Khmer Rouge Tribunal or uh, the Extraordinary Chambers. It, um, it took 10 years of political negotiation between Cambodia the state of Cambodia, um, Hun, the Hun Sen regime, really, and the um, United Nations. Um, the international community wanted to go through this and wanted um, to establish a tribunal by the Security Council because then it would have allocated funding from the get-go. But of course, we know um, um, China at every turn made it clear that it will veto any effort to, uh, to establish a tribunal um, anywhere, especially not through the Security Council, because the China um, was the patron of the Khmer Rouge and it was not going to try its um, protege or its, its pawn. Um, so um, it's, a, it's a hybrid court. Um, and so I'll, I guess I'll, I'll leave the, the um, and, and so I'll, I'll, the, the jurisdiction, the, the limitations uh, of briefly touch on the limitations of, of the, um, the, the tribunal. The jurisdiction, the authority, the court's authority to try um, uh, to put individuals on trial. The personal jurisdiction, the individuals who could be put on trial are of two groups. One, the senior Khmer Rouge leaders, that's, um, that's um, a technical term, and those most responsible. Senior Khmer Rouge leaders refer to the individuals who were responsible, who had authority over all of Cambodia. And those most responsible, for example, is the director of Do Slang, uh, who recently passed away, um, who was not a senior leader with overall authority, but was responsible for enough deaths, in Dirk's case, 16,000 deaths, um, to, to be included um, under the jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction. The temporal jurisdiction, the time um, limitation uh, which the court can, uh, has authority over are specified from April 17, 1975, when Phnom Penh fell, to um, January 7, 1979, when um, Vietnam had um, um, after Vietnam's Vietnamese invasion had complete control over Cambodia. So crimes committed one day before April 17 is not included in the Khmer Tribunal. For example, if you were killed by a bomb or killed by a Khmer Rouge soldier on April 16, you're not included. And if you were killed or murdered or died or um, after um, on April, uh, I'm sorry, on January 8th, you're not included. So that's the, the, the limit, the temporal jurisdiction. The subject matter, uh, mass crimes, genocide, and the uh, um, penal uh, statute we had at the time um, of, of, um, um, of the Khmer Rouge years. The, Khmer Rouge Tribunal, the, um, as a judicial mechanism, is necessary. Oh, it's still ongoing. So let me, um, it, it took 10 years of negotiation between the um, Cambodia, the government of Cambodia and the, uh, and the UN. And then it came um, it, it, um, to establish the agreement. The court was and came into operation in mid-2006. And now we're in 2020 and it's still going on, but no one knows about it and no one cares. Um, there are, of the five individuals which uh, have been put on trial, three of them have already died. Um, and the other two are in their late 80s and 90s um, with um, death looming um, 
any day now. So, oh, and then it's also a military compound, which is one of the limitations which we can go on, uh, we can discuss here and also in the breakout sessions. Um, the Khmer Rouge Tribunal as a court of law is necessary, but it's extremely insufficient and moreover in the Cambodian situation, deficient. But it, it served as a powerful, or it served, past tense, as a pow, powerful catalyst to jumpstart mechanisms for transitional justice, for re reconciliation and for dialogue. And it was during those first few years of operation when, when we in civil society were empowered by the funding that came in because of the presence of the court. So it had a very pur a useful purpose, less on the judiciary side, on the legal side, but because of its physical presence and the attention that it drew in terms of funding for us and in terms of um, um, triggering the attention among the population, thinking, wow, who are all these individuals? And, and the discussions were surrounding um, the court, um, whether um, they be positive or negative, corruption or someone has been brought to, um, uh, and brought to DAC. Um, so discussions were had, dialogue were had, all good things. So the, the court acted as a very, very powerful catalyst in jumpstarting these conversations. And one closest to me is trauma. Prior to the Khmer Rouge Tribunal, we were not allowed or we were ashamed to speak about trauma. It was a taboo subject. Um, it was, a, uh, and we didn't have the vocabulary. Um, so we didn't even know how to go about it, even if we wanted to. So I was very aware of, of this. Um, and so I um, intentionally told of my trauma experience, how I was suicidal as a, as a survivor of the Khmer Rouge, living in the United States, dealing with, with the past um, flooding over me, um, to break the taboo. And I knew I had to do it by example. And we also created a trauma handbook. So it's, and this is one of the elements of transitional justice, um, one of the mechanisms, dialogue, uh, 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 conversations, and um, the, uh, the particular and the specific topic of trauma. And not only in Cambodia, but um, anywhere where there's mass crimes, there are uh, issues of trauma. And many of these societies I know, and many of the individuals who encounter trauma um, are reluctant until someone from that society push the issue and um, uh, help to pierce the taboo. Transitional justice, uh, so prosecution, transitional justice, and reconciliation are issues um, that really focus on the Khmer Rouge years, not on the other genocides. And I hope to bring more light to the other genocides. But, but you know, it's 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 also good to remember. We can't well, we won't forget, and we can't forget the the Khmer Rouge years. Um, but it's um, these are uh, efforts that have been um, that that have been had with regards to reconciliation. Oh, I'll, I'll, I will, um, I'll say on um, transitional justice. One of the elements of transitional justice is um, is dialogue, um, and it's it's non judicial. It's um, it requires the um, non-judicial actors to be involved. And this is where civil society and, and the media have a very, very important role in um, helping to expand the, the, the arena so that more voices are had in the conversation. And I was very, very fortunate to um, have been leading then um, an, another NGO um, before Civicus where we conducted public forums and we continue with Civicus, but um, to a lesser degree. But during that time, we had so much funding and um, everyone was so excited about our forum, um, which we conducted throughout Cambodia with victims and perpetrators. And, uh, in certain provinces, there were, there were more, uh, there were more vi uh, victims who participated and, um, and others uh, more uh, perpetrators, for example, Pai Lin, the former um, Khmer Rouge hamlet. And we broadcast these conversations. So by the time we went to the Khmer Rouge um, hamlet, the, the, the perpetrators already had heard the conversations of the victims. 
So they couldn't deny, and you could see in their faces uh, as I was pushing them. And, and I genuinely, I, I mean, I, I didn't accuse them of crimes, but you could tell the conflict in their eyes because um, they have been denying it. And they haven't, and genuinely, they didn't know to a, to a large degree until these, they heard these conversations. Um, so, so these public, uh, we don't have an official Truth and Reconciliation Commission like um, the one in South Africa. But these forums conducted by organizations like mine and other organizations with a, with a little bit more different focus on, on um, psychological um, healing or, uh, or peace building um, are important players and we need to retain them and we need to um, recognize them. Now in Cambodia, the, um, these efforts, um, the Khmer Rouge um, Tribunal, the prosecution continues, but um, without, um, but I, I think it's more harmful now. The transitional justice mechanisms have been lessened or um, almost um, brought to a standstill because we have no civil society. We have no opposition party. We have no op opposition leaders. We have no independent media. I'm speaking now and we have no civil society, really. For example, right now, my work with reconciliation is more online, which is extremely limited, and my organization is really also very, very extremely limited. It's, it's more a, a, a personal um, private platform and semi-organizational um, because of the political repression and the larger political context. So the, also it impacts on um, our reconciliation efforts. We had um, uh, progress um, and, and it was recognized around the world, this, the Cambodian situation and our reconciliation efforts. But now those efforts are regressing and reconciliation is regressing. Moreover, we have the same actors who were involved in the Khmer Rouge era back in Cambodia. They are the Khmer Rouge, which is Hun Sain. He was former Khmer Rouge and now continues to be the, um, the leader of Cambodia and one of the longest serving leaders of Cambodia. We have China, the patron of the Khmer Rouge. We have Vietnam, who has always main, uh, maintained a presence, but more low key. And um, we have of all the thousands with bloody hands, they're still there because only five were put on trial and three have died. And so here we are. I'm, I'm so sorry to end on such a down note, but I still have hope because I'm living in Cambodia and I continue to live and, and, and work here and, and there has to be hope. But the challenges are great. Um, and, um, but, but there's always space if you're creative enough, but, uh, but the challenges are great at the moment with regards to the, um, using the court as, as, um, as a means um, toward peace building and reconciliation and transitional justice is limited because of the lack of civil society and, and the reconciliation efforts have been regressing. So I'll end there and open up um, for discussion. Back to you, Alex. Terry, thank you so much for speaking from your personal experiences in Cambodia. Um, that was really powerful to hear about. So we've received a lot of positive feedback from the other panels about the interaction between the panelists. And so we've decided that we're not gonna hold the breakout sessions after the fact. We're just gonna leave this time now for you three panelists to interact with one another. Um, we can receive anonymous questions from people who are viewing in the audience, but to start with right now, um, I'm opening it up to the three of you. If either of you would like to ask one another questions of curiosity or comments about one another's work or experiences, please feel free to do so. Well, I have a question um, for both um, to Wanda and for Vivian, but maybe more um, so for Vivian with regards to um, the the growth of international law in the 1990s and now i mean how do you see the future of international law how do we jump start the the uh, the uh, the need um, for uh, institutions and agreements to focus on um, international criminal um, and justice great so um, in terms of the question, I mean, fantastic, fantastic question. I mean, it's one that is, of course, of concern to, to all of us. Um, we've seen a great deal of activity. We see actually a number of 
crimes that are being addressed both at the international level and at the national level. Um, but as both of you have actually pointed out, certainly we're wide away from ending impunity for all international crimes. There is a certain effort that we see, um, which has also been propelled by civil society actors. Um, and there we see really some states on a national level taking leadership and you know, really making pioneering efforts to prosecute um, some of these crimes at the national level in domestic courts. Um, but certainly also the international courts are contributing um, on a very, very profound level to the accountability efforts that we are seeing. It remains a continuous challenge for sure. Um, it presupposes certainly the political will to come to terms with the past, to put individuals on trial, and thus it's, it's a constant, if you like, it's a constant demand um, both on policymakers as well as, of course, um, upholding then the independence of the courts and allowing the investigators and the prosecutors to thoroughly um, and independently conduct their work going forward. I know Tawanda has been very um, active, of course, in the arena of the civil society engagement, in particular vis-a-vis -vis the International Criminal Court. And, and there, again, I'd be curious to, to hear more in terms of how do you see what the kind of current challenges are. Um, we've recently had the independent expert review, for example, of the International Criminal Court. A number of fascinating um, developments at the international level and in The Hague. What is your sense in terms of um, the perspectives of civil society, and certainly there is an enormous heterogeneity um, amongst the different actors. Um, but what's your sense there in terms of the, the current pressures and, and the current windows of opportunity that you, that you see there? Uh, thanks, Thierry and uh, Vivian for those questions. Um, perhaps let me give you, what I think, what is uh, essentially my own take uh, on what's happening and uh, prospects especially for uh, victims uh, and survivors of, uh, of, of genocide. There are obvious challenges and headwinds, uh, and most of those are geopolitical in nature. Now, I think Thierry asked a question about, you know, um, what um, opportunities there are, um, you know, with respect to developments of international law. Uh, the value that I see, and I think that's quite obvious, is the norm setting uh, since the 90s and, and even before that. And that has actually been growing. So the pronouncements and decisions of the International Criminal Court, not all of them, are uh, you know, exactly consistent, but that in itself has resulted in norm setting. Um, and which has percolated into jurisprudence of various courts, domestic courts. Uh, and so that's a positive. On the negative is the issue that for survivors of mass atrocities, you know, be they in Myanmar, you know, in, 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 in Syria, in many of the other conflicts that we see in, in you know, on the African continent, in Sudan, um, and and other places. There has been precious little in the way of justice, in the way of perpetrators being brought to account, and for the ability to be able to move forward with the acknowledgement not only of just the domestic state, but also regionally and internationally of the challenges that survivors went through. And the question is why? Part of that can actually be found in the architecture or international architecture where the United Nations system is failing to uphold peace and international peace and security, where the conflicts uh, and, and, and competition, between, especially between uh, the P5, so the permanent five members, is stalling progress not just on issues as that we're talking about now, which is about international justice, but on many other issues, and including 
with respect to progressive norm setting in the world. So that's one of the key challenges now. So very briefly, in a VM, there is absolutely no question that the uh, International Criminal Court is at a crossroads. It is at a crossroads internally because of uh, the cases that it's handled, the pronouncements that is issued, which has clashed with some of the expectations of those of many survivors, uh, in many in civil society who believed and believe that if an individual is indicted, and again, this tends to be evidence that those who are indicted uh, are, you know, are likely to be responsible for, when then uh, there are acquittals, sometimes based on the fact that not enough evidence was put before the court, that has created discord um, and, you know, disaffection with uh, how the court itself works. That said, there's absolutely no question that the court, about the role, the very important role that the court has played, the International Criminal Court has played and continues to play. The other danger are the sanctions uh, or the sanctions regime that has been imposed by the United States. And if we have the United States acting as it has and imposing sanctions, what's to stop other nations doing that? And if the United Nations then impose uh, economic sanctions against the court, that will destroy it. Already, by putting individuals under the sanctions regime, will have a chilling effect on its ability to undertake investigations impartially, independently, and effectively. And so, from all of us, and especially, I think, from those in the civil society, the concern is that we have entered, not that we're entering, that we, but we have entered a new era in which issues of international justice, be they at a domestic level or regionally, so high, with hybrid courts, or and internationally, face numerous challenges and victims are less likely to get the effective justice that they require. And where there is justice, it's likely to be victor's justice or where the state is the one that picks up an individual and sends them to the international court. Uh, so the hope is, you know, I, I hope is that the international court survives, that the European Union will stand by the court, uh, make sure that they pass regulations that enable the court to be able to survive in case that the US does uh, activate its, uh, well, it has activated its um, executive order, but by placing economic sanctions against the court itself as an institution rather than against individuals. So that's the hope, but it will take a lot of effort from all of us, especially within the United States of, uh, of America, with both uh, parties needing to take a stand. But the question is, how likely is that going to happen? Well, I mean, I think you rightly point out that absolutely the recent developments are quite disconcerting um, and it's a new quality um, in terms of engagement or disengagement vis-a-vis um, -vis the court. And certainly you mentioned multilateralism, you know, the contestation surrounding multilateralism today at wider level, but certainly also as it pertains to the International Criminal Court in particular, um, is one where the you know, there's a reshuffling, if you like, in terms of the engagement and the disengagement of particular states. So you rightly point out that it's certainly important to continue observing um, these developments. Um, incidentally, yesterday I attended an online conference on the UN at 75, Effective Multilateralism and in International Law, organized by the UN Office of Legal Affairs and the Federal Foreign Office of Germany. And importantly, the, the role of courts in international law and the development of international law and the implementation of international law was highlighted. And, and certainly the, the complex interplay there that we're seeing playing out in terms of the necessity of cooperation of states for allowing these international institutions to function is, is of vital importance. Uh, if I could ask you, uh, Vivian, a question, do you see 
uh, increased or reduced international cooperation in the world, especially in where, you know, with respect to issues of international justice? Well, I mean, you know, not an easy question to answer. I think certainly there's a there's a quite heterogeneous um, or fragmented picture that we're seeing in some instances. There is a very strong level of cooperation um, that we're seeing a strong engagement on the accountability front and in certain instances. Um, there is certainly um, a disengagement and a lack of cooperation, um, which is undermining the efforts of bringing individuals to trial. Um, certainly there, it, it, I think, depends in terms of there's a whole amalgamation, of course, of, of factors that explain the particular instances of cooperation or, or lack of cooperation. Um, but it's certainly one where one sees that the effectiveness of these institutions is linked to the wider actor landscape, which includes states, which includes um, other actors in terms of being able to perform the functions in, in the set time. So that's certainly where um, it becomes important to, you know, uphold or to, to renew the resolve. And I know um, you've just mentioned that within, within civil society, there, there is a strong resolve um, and among the advocates and um, scholarly community to precisely point out then where cooperation is most dire needed, um, where cooperation actually is, is a key to allowing these beneficiaries um, of justice efforts and accountability procedures um, being taken forward. Question for both you, Vivian and uh, Tawanda, with regards to the rising role of China in all of this. Um, we in, uh, in Cambodia feel the heat because it's just sort of, I mean, China is, we're, we're becoming a village of China. Um, but I wonder how, how China is viewed from your part of the world with regards to these issues of international justice and their uh, rising role, a global um, role in terms of creating uh, multilateral institutions, um, heading and leading um, new multilateral institutions and, and efforts. Uh, maybe let me you know answer the question. Uh, and again, this is a personal opinion. Uh, I think we're seeing an interesting de development uh, where especially when you look at it in the context of the United Nations, where in some parts, uh, China, which used to be known for not necessarily being very multilateral uh, and support, supportive, <coughs> excuse me, supportive of multilateral institutions, right now, uh, if you take the World Health Organization, right? China is one of those that's actually coming up to engage and, 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 and support. When you contrast China and the United States with you know, the number of international agreements to which the United uh, States is pulling back from, uh, it's clear that we're entering into a world that's highly complex, where positions that we used to take for granted are being upended. Um, and this is obviously unsettling, but my personal views are that there is an opportunity here uh, to engage all countries, particularly the, those in the P5, but also emerging powers uh, on the need to increase international cooperation, not decrease international cooperation. COVID-19 has just shown us the need for increased cooperation. I'm using international cooperation uh, instead of saying multilateralism. Um, and there's absolutely no question that we face in the risk of increased conflict in a world where countries have nuclear weapons and more countries have nuclear weapons, where the ability to deploy not just chemical or biological agents, but also using technology, uh, 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 you know, modern computer software. Be and that become you know cyber warfare that that, that become uh, becoming one of the weapons that is used to attack um, so the risk to us as humanity and to the world at large is more 
than it ever used to be. And the, as a consequence of which, I think my view would be, uh, we do actually need to make sure that we push countries, particularly the P5, particularly the, you know, the emerging powers on the need to increase uh, cooperation and push back against uh, increased nationalism, as well as the big powers uh, fighting each other, including on issues of international trade. I think now we're gonna take some questions from the audience. I have one that's directed um, at Dr. Hondura from Andres Borjas. He's also a member of the Epic Colloquium. He asks, what is the role, and I think you've touched on this a little bit, but he asks, what is the role of geopolitics in the changing world order and the ability of the ICC and other institutions in pursuing transitional justice? Um, the role is a significant one. Um, it's a one that uh, will determine the future of the International Criminal Court and, inter and transitional justice as a whole. Um, as I alluded to, there's a very real risk that at the stroke of a pen, the ICC can be destroyed if the United States uh, lists the court uh, as an entity under its executive order, or at least many more individuals, uh, especially those in the prosecution team um, within that executive order. And the reason why that, that, that's critical is because individuals will, the court is gonna to struggle to attract individuals to undertake investigations. Judges are likely to not want to, uh, to take cases which might, which they think might offend the United States. And that will harm the reputation. So even if the court survives, its reputation will be destroyed if the current efforts are not, um, you know, if the United States has not pushed back and pulled back rather uh, on its, its current efforts. At the same time, it's not just the United States, the many more powerful countries that are not party to the Rome Statute that are perhaps you know, would we'll, we'll see and take comfort from what the United States is doing. And although we have, what, 123, 124 countries that are, you know, part of the, uh, uh, of the Rome Statute, there are other bigger powers out there that we would want, ideally, to be part of the International uh, uh, Criminal Court. So you take Russia, you take China, you take India. These are big countries, the United States itself in order for the Rome Statute to be universal. Why should it be universal? Because obviously, after World War II, after Rwanda, we said, no more. But did we really? And with what's currently happening, it's clear that uh, it is geopolitics, because it's a multilateral institution. It is geopolitics that's going to determine its future. Uh, and it's going to take a lot more from us, opinion makers, to influence and to change the direction uh, in which the world is currently traveling, which is an undermining of the International Criminal Court. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is directed at Vivian, who I think can answer first, but then I think, I think all three of you would, would have really interesting perspectives on this. Um, this comes from Anna. What do you think is the limit between punishing the individual and the state? Because all actions taken by a state are commanded by individuals. So it is a fine line. How do you know when to punish the state and when to punish the individual? Um, Vivian, if you could start with this, that'd be awesome. Sure, great question. In terms of the you know, conceptual developments of how to handle um, crimes that were committed, this postulating individual criminal responsibility lies at the core of modern international criminal law, which means that precisely it is, you know, an individual who is accountable for his or her acts. This is very important for transitional justice in the sense that there is not a, a general, you know, blanket um, culpability of the state or rather of the um, groups um, that 
are involved in a particular conflict, but really it's down to the individual level. So the atomization of responsibility um, sees an effort being played out to attribute responsibility um, correctly and at the same time allowing wider societal processes of reconciliation to go by. Now, if the question is, is about, you know, certainly many of the crimes, um, especially relating to some of the historic examples, were committed um, with the full backing of a state apparatus. Um, so there we certainly have individuals operating um, in a very, very particular, um, if you like, framework, and hence the difficulty of dissecting kind of state um, responsibility and individual responsibility. International criminal law is about individual responsibility. Certainly there is a wider paradigm about state responsibility and we have the draft articles from the International Law Commission which deals precisely with state responsibility um, and yet there I think is an important conceptual distinction to be made in terms of the accountability efforts um, that we've been speaking about in terms of our discussion here today, mostly focused on these individual criminal prosecutions. Um, the state responsibility, um, that particular framework has seen very interesting developments um, in some of the cases at the um, International Court of Justice um, have of course been more on the state to state level, um, but certainly in terms of the international criminal law paradigm, um, those individual cases um, have been most prominent. Thank you, Vivian. Um, if, if any of the other panelists would like to, to consider that question, or if not, we can move on to um, other questions posed by members in our audience. I'll just like to add, sorry if you hear the noise in the background now, it's just ringing cats and dogs here. Um, I would just like to add um, that prosecution or the legal mechanism is very limited in terms of, it's limited to symbolic justice. So with regards to responsibility and punishment, um, again, because Cambodia is the, uh, the best uh, situation I know, when thousands have bloody hands and only five are prosecuted, it's necessary the prosecution to uh, it's necessary for the prosecution to move forward, but for its symbolic value, because justice needs to be seen to be done, and a court procedure um, allows for that. Um, it allows for collective reaction and action to um, and to express our collective disgust at the crimes. So uh, we need to remember that. It's symbolic and it's limited, um, the punishment and the, um, the issue of fairness and um, responsibility. Another example with, with Deutsch, for example, he was the director of one prison among 200, but this government and now with the stamp of approval of the United Nations have tried to place and have succeeded in placing the blame of the whole Khmer Rouge era on one director of one prison among 200 prisons. So how does that play into individual responsibility and state action and um, the rest? So just a reminder that um, prosecution is important for its symbolic justice in this regard. Hilary, may I just ask you in terms of thank you again for also your earlier um, wonderful presentation and very intimate knowledge of course of the of the Cambodian context and just on the point that you mentioned um, the discussions on the the legacies of the um, extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia I'd be curious to, to get your own insights in terms of some of the recent discussions that have taken place I, I recall vividly you know very early um, major um, form of discussion on legacies was the legacies conference that took place in 2012 um, actually just after one case had been concluded so at a you know temporarily speaking at a much earlier stage than comparatively at the other ad hoc tribunals and um, when discussions of legacy had come up after numerous cases had already been concluded i'd just be curious in terms of your own 
insights into, into that discussion, how it's continued, um, how obviously civil society has continued its engagement um, in observing and, and being very active um, as the legacy discussions in, in Cambodia have evolved. One of the um, encouraging benefits or one of the benefits that we had hoped for was building on the legacy via the documentation um, produced by the courts. I mean, the prosecutors have a very efficient way and have a very um, trusted way of, uh, of acquiring and accumulating evidence to tell the larger stories for um, the, the fate of future generations. But now that legacy is being um, is jeopardized because the documentation, the documents, and the um, archives of the court will be in the hands of this current government. And without the um, without the participation of civil society in archiving, in um, in accessing the documentation of the court. So one of the one of the biggest legacies they had hoped for is um, is jeopardized. So this is why, for the longest time, I um, I, I supported the court. And this is why I denounced the court because um, it uh, it the benefits of the court of uh, the the harm outweighed the benefits. And one of the benefits that we had hoped for was the documentation for future generation to to uh, to search and research. Um, to better understand uh, the, the history. And so the, uh, and again, currently we have no civil society really, effective civil society who are um, focusing on human rights, on, on sensitive issues of, um, of justice, which um, uh, touch on government roles. We, we don't have those individuals and organizations anymore who are active, we have them. I mean, I consider myself one of them, um, but I'm extremely limited in what I can do now as an individual without the, um, without um, the larger platform of an, of an institution. So this is one of the reasons why I no longer supported the court because, um, because of the legacy issue. Thank you. Thank you, Terry, for sharing your thoughts. Um, I, I can go our, to one of our next questions. This one is for uh, Dr. Andorra from Beatrice. What are your thoughts on the idea that there exists, and this is something that we actually talked about in our, um, in our epic class in one of our lectures. What are your thoughts on the idea that there exists a predominantly Eurocentric model of international justice, considering allegations that the ICC has a racial or Eurocentric bias, for example, as all of the individuals who were ever indicted by the court are black or Arab Africans, or on the contrary, the claims that such allegations are attempts made by the perpetrators of atrocity crimes to impede justice. Uh, thanks. Well, I think that's a, uh, you know, an interesting question. Uh, it's, it's, it's a powerful one as well. Um, the question there, I think that uh, is raised is about the role of power politics. Um, in the arena of international justice. Um, now, an argument can be, in fact be made uh, that uh, the International Criminal Court, the way it has operated so far, um, and the nature of the justice is racialized. That argument can be made. But part of the challenge is that that's not looking at it in, you know, it's not, it, it won't be as considered an analysis um, because if one looks at how uh, individuals have ended up at the International Criminal Court, with most of the early cases, it was states themselves that referred the situations to, so those in Africa, in other words, to the court. So there's an issue of power politics at play, but that's very local. Um, and that has a lot to do with the conflicts in a particular country or conflicts that are uh, uh, sub-regional. Now, right now, one of the key um, risks to the court is, is not actually 
um, the cases that it undertook uh, in Africa, which resulted, I think, in some African countries uh, threatening to pull out of the Rome Statute, is actually to do with the United States and the conflicts in Afghanistan and potentially the conflicts uh, that we see uh, with, you know, with the Mapi Mamara uh, incident with uh, Israel and Palestine. Um, and uh, according to the US, other instances where the US is opposed to, you know, if you look at the executive order, uh, you know, it'll, you know, the, the sanctions are in response and re 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 retaliation for uh, the court investigating and potentially investigating in the future cases in which the US is an interest. If again, one looks at it from that perspective, it becomes clear that although the court has come under a lot of attack from very many different quarters, it is young. It is trying to do the best under exceptionally difficult conditions. And so I would argue uh, that some allegations or accusations, uh, including of racial bias, may miss the mark uh, if not enough attention is paid to each of the individual cases uh, that the court has focused on uh, and the power politics inherent in that particular uh, 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 situation or, you know, or, or, or jurisdiction. I think that, that would be my, 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 my response to that. So yes, an argument can be made, but I don't think it'll be able to withstand close scrutiny. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question for, um, oh, sure. for both the panelists, but also for um, maybe uh, more toward um, uh, Tawanda, with regards to the role of regional courts. Um, how do you see the role of regional courts um, in light of the ICC? Uh, I think my personal view on this is that um, justice needs to be done locally. Uh, and if locally, it cannot be done because of, you know, particular uh, political situations, then regionally. And only if that fails or that opportunity does not exist, should you go internationally. There are so many numerous challenges that come with, for victims, the ability to attend court, the ability to communicate, to empathize, um, having this system as a whole, uh, to know your challenges as a victim or as a survivor, to be able to reach out and make sure that you know, you're, 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 you're protected as, a, as an individual and as a community. Those are some of the challenges that have come that we currently see uh, with the International Criminal Court. And, and to be fair, the court is well aware of those. So they have outreach sessions, they engage, but even then that cannot and will not be able to replace uh, local mechanisms um, and how those discussions that come locally will be able to help a country move forward or a people move forward and uh, resolve and uh, help resolve uh, the challenges that they went through. It just it has to be local. I mean I would add to that perhaps that the you know primary consideration is whether accountability um, can be done and often it's not a question of whether but where when and how and where that's precisely the question that that you answered um perhaps it's it's a secondary consideration in terms of the forum of where such trials are being adjudicated um in the sense that whether it's locally um, regionally or internationally um the main effort is to actually have a legal trial to um seek accountability and you know as to wonder highlighted of course you know there's a reason we've seen in the developments from the ad hoc tribunals which had the the principle of primacy to the international criminal court operating more under the principle of complementarity and there's a reason why only if a state is unwilling or unable do the cases actually um, come forcefully to the international level and certainly this idea of holding the trials um, in the most effective arena 
um, so that it can make a meaningful contribution to the affected communities is of critical importance. Um, and so there often is this artificial juxtaposition of the either the international and the regional level or the regional level and the, the domestic level. And, and certainly there is a more prolific um, synergies that, that can be, you know, dissected, if you like, um, in terms of how the various courts um, scenarios can actually play out. That being said, of course, the, you know, instantiations or the idiosyncratic settings of a particular court, you know, need some um, scrutinizing um, in terms of upholding um, the rule of law, um, fair trials and, and the normative underpinnings um, that are demanded of such justice efforts. Perhaps if I can just quickly uh, re respond to that, but actually adding an, uh, uh, an extra point, which is about uh, what does justice mean to individuals and to communities? Uh, and what should we uh, be advocating for? In many of the countries where um, there's an accusation that the country is either unwilling or unable, there's also an issue, typically an issue of resources and about the domestic criminal justice system itself. So one of the issues that we ought to be pushing for is the strengthening of cr domestic criminal justice systems and mechanisms in order that if there's a domestic trial, the jurisprudence that comes out of that is local. And there's an understanding and an acceptance locally. It's quite different in my view. Um, and again, this is just looking at it from a political lens rather than from a legal lens, but from a political lens, uh, there, is, there tends to be greater acceptance of domestic jurisprudence progressive than regional than international, because we said it. Um, and so I think it touches on to the point that uh, I think, Terry, you, 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 you've raised, uh, and, and Vivian is right, you know, it, there tends to be this artificial distinction between domestic, sub-regional, and international. Um, and perhaps that's, that may not, you know, be I think the best way of approaching or or, or, or reviewing the, uh, the 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 issue. However, there is a lot to be said about making sure that domestically, we have strong institutions, and in regions where there have been uh, atrocities, or that there is need for some uh, justice mechanisms to be created, those be sub-regional. In Europe, we have those institutions with, you know, the, uh, the Court of Human Rights, the European Court of Human Rights, the, you know, Court of Justice to deal with local challenges. And for most domestic uh, uh, criminal issues, those are dealt with domestically. So there's this sense, I think, in using that as a model for some of the, re no, for the regions in the world. And there is clearly and definitely a role for the international uh, court uh, within that superstructure. And I think, Tawanda, you, you very rightly point out, I mean, there is no one size fits all model, if you like, for um, how to deal with the past, how to deal with atrocities being committed. We've seen that in various instances where there have been, you know, new developments that have been on the horizon. I'm just thinking of the Hiss and Habre trial, for instance, where the African Union had a fundamental role to play and which was very different to some of the um, developments that we had seen hitherto in terms of what was, you know, imaginative um, in terms of at which level or how um, atrocities would be dealt with. And, and certainly in terms of the domestic arena, as you rightly point out, you know, oftentimes these trials may happen in the immediate aftermath or actually years, if not decades after the fact. And certainly that's also very important that there, you, you rightly point out the local buy-in, the, the ownership over the process, um, which makes it all the more meaningful and you know, productive in terms of the wider reconciliation processes that are ongoing um, in, in that particular context and, and setting. I think those were the considerations for the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. Um, the, failing, the failure of the Khmer Rouge Tribunal is not because of its location here in Cambodia. We have a very weak judiciary system. 
the um, we tend to focus the and we tend to cast the blame on the Cambodian government, and the Cambodian government has its share. But we need to also focus on the UN players and the um, and what the United Nations mean in Cambodia, in a place like Cambodia. When we speak about the United Nations, we speak as if it's monolithic. Um, or the international community in Cambodia, but we have Japanese judges or officials, we have a New Zealander, we have German, we have French. All those individuals represent their nations when they are in Cambodia with varying interests, with um, political interests, um, not at the same level as the Cambodian side, but we need to be aware that they do exist and that they play a role in the success or the failure of the courts. I put also put a lot of blame on the UN side in the Cambodian situation. Um, we already know the failures and the problems and the challenges on the Cambodian side, and they're real. Um, and, and, I, and I know they're real because I speak about and, and, uh, and address them uh, regularly. But what is com un and not commonly um, addressed is the lack of political will in certain critical situations in the, pro in the process in, uh, in the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. So I, um, not equal blame, but I, I also want to um, draw attention to the role of international players in a place like Cambodia, um, which um, determine whether a court fails or succeeds. In this situation, it fails because of the Cambodian government, and we know their failings, but also because of the UN um, and international community. I mean, Terry, if I may just pick up on the um, extraordinary chambers, as, as part of my multi-year research on, on legacies, I, I also looked at the extraordinary chambers, and you know, it resonates in terms of what you're speaking about and, and sharing the insights of. Um, they're particularly. Um, in my work, I, I looked more at theorizing the construction of legacies um, rather than measuring the effectiveness um, of, the, of the tribunal per se. And there, there was a clear early impetus to, to pursue legacy at the extraordinary chambers, um, which however got caught, caught up in a, in a political tussle about ownership of the narrative of legacy and, and meaning making and, and funding. Um, and eventually was, was largely abandoned as a result um, when I studied the issue. The tribunal appears to have hesitantly or ambiguously embraced this role of legacy lever. Um, and you rightly point out, I mean, it's a whole amalgamation or, or wide and, and rich actor landscape in which the extraordinary chambers have operated uh, within the Cambodian setting. So it, it appears that the engagement on legacy has accelerated and decelerated um, over, over the years. And the contestation of meaning um, that you alluded to also and what the ECCC could or should actually leave behind um, provides a window into the broader contestation and the normative significance of the construction of meaning in Cambodia in that particular setting. Well, yeah, in a place like Cambodia. Sorry. I was just going to say quickly, uh, has Victor, Vivian, has Victor's justice been a consistent theme that has acted to undermine or to, yeah, to, to, to undermine the cause of international justice all the way from you know, uh, World War I to today? I mean, it's certainly been you know, a concept that has dominated the discussions, the public discourse, but also the scholarship, especially early on. We've seen this with the Nuremberg trials. Um, as, you, as you say, um, this was often the you know, most prominent critique that was addressed vis-a-vis -vis the um, the Nuremberg trials. It was also what dominated um, discussions and um, much scholarship on the, the Tokyo trials, for instance. Um, and only in more recent years has one seen the scholarship become much more nuanced and go beyond this particular um, very important discussion to be had, for sure, um, but also a bit limiting if you like discussion, because it disallows then the nuances um, and the you know, sophisticated engagement with actually the politics as they played out in a particular instance of international trials um, to go forward. But certainly, um, you know, the critique of, of Victor's justice is one to grapple with, one that um, each and all of the settings that we've seen um, has played out differently, has been also used differently um, in terms of um, you know, legitimizing or delegitimizing particular instances. Um, but certainly it's one that 
deserves to be taken seriously, but also, you know, to, to go beyond that particular um, critique to, to be able to dissect much more, you know, astutely what actually is going on in this very complex interplay of, of law and politics. We have time for one final question from the audience and then I'll just give some uh, wrapping up remarks. Um, this is a question for Terry. This is from um, Injin Khan. She's also a member of the Epic Colloquium. And so I'll be quoting her right now. She writes, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I know that you're a huge advocate for education as a form of justice for the Cambodian people. I wanna know more about your definition of a good education. How would civic education play a role in reconciling with the past and mitigating mistrust and fear among the Cambodian society? Here in Myanmar, this is where Injun is from, here in Myanmar, there's really very few conversations going on regarding the Rohingya genocide. And far from that, the xenophobic sentiments remain highly prevalent in a Burmese society. So today, even though we are going through a process of getting legal justice for the Rohingyas, getting social and other forms of justice still remain very far-fetched in, in, in this Burmese society. So I was wondering if you could expand on the situation in Cambodia regarding the culture of having conversations about huge tragedies like genocide and others in order to reconcile with our painful past, or if there are any consequences to speaking up about these issues. We need to find ways for um, individuals to have their voice heard now or later, um, have their narratives be preserved be it in a court, which is more official, or be it in storytelling, but preserve them via a film, via written, uh, in written form, but we need to collect stories um, for um, if, if the situation of the political environment allows for, um, for the dissemination of these narratives now, great. If not, we preserve them for later. So back, um, and this ties in with the legacy, um, whose narrative is being heard and, and the rewriting of history. I'm very concerned about the rewriting of history because history re requires many voices, many competing voices to be heard so that we can sift through the competing factors if there are any, or the compete, and competing narratives if there are any. And of course, in these situations, there will be many. And we need to hear from all sides, no matter how difficult they are. So, and I was very aware of this, that and, and for, take, for example, the, the Khmer Rouge, I gave him time, the, the perpetrators. I, I didn't belittle him, I didn't accuse him. I, I, I allowed the, and the victim's voices to resonate through him and let him um, and work that out within himself. But we need to hear, um, uh, and, which is, uh, which is nothing new, really. When you write something, you want to hear from all sides to get a more comprehensive story. And that's what we're trying to do. It's just more difficult in conflict zone. Um, and uh, as well as a, a place like Cambodia where the conflict has, um, has ended, but, um, but still simmering in society, the violence has taken different shape and different forms um, that aren't um, uh, necessarily um, the, 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 a war battlefield. So, Yes, um, and so I'm back to uh, the, the, the uh, not back to, but it ties in with the legacy, the narrative, and a place like Cambodia or in the, in the Rohingya situation, which I really don't know that well. But in conflict place, um, and zones, we need to preserve and to collect victims' voices um, as soon as possible in whatever forms and preserve them for later usage or um, if, if they can't be used in the immediate sense. Uh, because these, um, because in the future, institutions, um, leaders with uh, invidious intentions will create institutions to tell their history. And when there are no competing um, 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 places for narratives, be it in school or be it in, in homes or in, in, in other institutions, to counterbalance these official narratives, then we're in trouble. In Cambodia, we have still slang which is a very politicized institution, but it's a learning institution. Um, and then we have the Khmer Rouge Tribunal, and now this is back to the, the, the documentation um, that will um, be had and be controlled by the government. This is why I'm so concerned, because the narrative there now has a UN um, and stamp of approval. So it will be controlled by the government to manipulate um, uh, or to, uh, to deny access or to delete and de erase certain um, information from, um, from the, um, the um, 
a rich corpus of materials which have been accumulated over these years by um, experts in the legal process. So, but we can, um, we can do it through film, we can do it through poetry, we can do it through the arts, we can do it through music. We need to preserve victims' voices um, because they will help to counteract uh, the official narrative, which will always be very skewed. Thank you, Terry. Um, I just want to thank all three of you. Vivian's calling in from Nuremberg. Tawanda is calling in from London. Terry's calling in from Cambodia. For me right now, it's 2.37 uh, a.m. For all the people on the East Coast who have been tuning in this whole time, we thank you so much for your interest in this very, very, very important topic of after genocide, prosecution, transitional justice, and reconciliation. The next panel will be at 11 a.m. Um, on the topic of memory, survival, and genocide. So um, if you're interested, please look out for, that, for those Zoom links. And um, thank you everyone who has made this possible and um, we hope you enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.